Roberts. Today's topic impacts many people across the United States. It's diabetes. It's been called an ec epidemic here in the United States, and we have a great expert that's here to talk to you about it today. Dr. Richard Prattley is not only a diabetes expert, he's also involved in the research side of things, trying to understand how we can combat this disease. Some of that's going on right here at Florida Hospital. I've got a couple of questions here that's going to get us started, but we certainly would love to, for you to join in and just submit your question using the chat forum on the bottom of the video screen to participate. The doctor is in, so let's get started. Dr. Prattley, thank you so much for joining us today. Thanks, Jen. I'm really happy to be here. Yeah, fantastic. Tell me a little bit about this epidemic of diabetes. What does that actually mean? How many people is that? So that's a really good question. Why would we call something like diabetes an epidemic? And it turns out it's all in the numbers. In the United States alone, we have 26 million people who have diabetes. Interestingly, only about two-thirds of those people know they have the disease. So there are a lot of people who are walking around that don't know that they have diabetes. That's really only the tip of the iceberg, however. If you look at people who are at risk for diabetes, what we call pre-diabetes, there are another 80 million people of those in the country. Now, about one out of eight of those people will progress to developing diabetes every year. That's about 1.7 million people developing diabetes every year. So that's what we mean by an epidemic. It's a huge problem. It involves lots of our population, almost 8% of our population, and that number has been growing over the last 20 years. Yeah. Diabetes is very expensive, uh, and it's associated with lots of complications, and that's why we really care about diabetes and preventing it. Yeah, some of those um, those numbers that you talked about. I mean, the numbers are just staggering. When you it's kind of they all run together. But when you think about a hundred a million people getting it every year, what do you attribute that growth to? So, experts have been trying to figure out why we've had such a problem with diabetes. It really has exploded in the last twenty five years or so, and there's several trends that we think contribute to that. The first is that our population is getting uh, more obese and more sedentary. And both of those things are risk factors for developing diabetes. Mm -hmm. Our population is getting a little bit older as well. And older people tend to have more diabetes. And third, we have more diversity in our population. And certain ethnic groups are at much higher risk for developing diabetes. So we're seeing growth in those populations and concurrently a growth in diabetes because of that. So we really think it's multifactorial. Now, we can't do anything about our population aging, mm -hmm. and we certainly want diversity in our population. But what we can do something about is the obesity and the sedentary lifestyle that we lead. So that's the areas to focus on. I know one of the things you wanted to talk about was, was pre-diabetics. I know we talked about um, and, and made the news as well. Tom Hanks just announced recently that he had type 2 diabetes, and part of his announcement was that he didn't really have any idea that he had this. And that's not uncommon, right? That's absolutely true. Most people with, who are diagnosed with diabetes have no symptoms whatsoever. They're found incidentally on routine lab screening when they go to their doctor. And that's actually not a bad scenario because that means we're typically catching the disease early on in the course of the uh, disease and uh, before we have the chance to develop lots of complications uh, of diabetes. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, a lot of people have it that don't know it. Are there certain signs and symptoms should you be looking for in addition to those regular health checkups that you were talking about how some people find it? Yeah, there's some very typical signs of having uncontrolled diabetes. These include things like uh, an unexpected weight loss, uh, being real thirsty, having to urinate very frequently. These are all signs of high blood sugar. Some other subtle symptoms uh, may be a little bit more difficult to differentiate from diabetes and other conditions, such as a lot of fatigue uh, and generalized weakness. But those first three signs, the weight loss, the need to drink uh, frequently, and the need to urinate frequently are pretty typical for uncontrolled diabetes. So those should be your warning signs. Yeah, and those are the, those are the highlights. Um, are there any uncommon symptoms um, that people should be aware of or should be kind of tuned into? Maybe if you're experiencing some of those, those key symptoms that you talked about. Uh, sometimes uh, it can be, uh, as I said, subtle. It can be fatigue. Sometimes it can be blurring of vision. And sometimes uh, people get diagnosed when they go for their eye exam. Their vision has changed, and their eye doctor will see something in the back of their eye that suggests that they have 
diabetes. So pay attention to those signs as well. Yeah, you got to get the eyes checked, and you got to go to the family practice doctor, yeah. and you got to get the blood work done. It's all an important part of, of understanding the whole picture. It is a lot, but it ultimately it comes down to getting the right tests mm -hmm. to diagnose diabetes. Is, is the diabetes piece, is that something that's regularly tested for in blood screenings when you go to your family practice doctor for that annual physical? So um, when you go for an annual physical and you get blood tests, typically what they'll do is check a fasting blood sugar, and that's one of the tests for diagnosing diabetes. Mm -hmm. um, but there are other tests that uh, can be used as well. One is called the hemoglobin A1C, which gives you additional information about your risk for diabetes. But you'd have to order that specially. It's not part of the routine screening. Mm -hmm. And then finally, there are other tests where we really suspect the case of diabetes uh, but we're having difficulty making the diagnosis, we might do a glucose tolerance test where somebody drinks a sugar solution and we measure the blood sugar afterwards. Now those are actually more common when we're looking for diabetes in women who are pregnant. Yeah, I remember taking that one, mm -hmm. twice. <laughs> Fortunately for me, it came back negative, but yeah. it, it, you know, you got to drink the liquid and hang out for a while. It's not too bad of a test, though. It's not a bad test, but it does take more time. Yeah, yeah. And who are those people that should be screened? Is there family history? Is there some particular markers that says, um, I should make sure that I'm getting those extra tests? Yeah. So the two strongest risk factors for developing diabetes are having a family history and being overweight. So if you have a first degree relative, a mother, a father, a sister, or brother who has diabetes, that increases your risk of developing diabetes to about 40%. That's your lifetime risk. And that's in the general population. Mm -hmm. If you have two first degree relatives, that risk is almost double. Mm -hmm. So a strong family history is one of your indicators that you should get tested regularly after the age of 40 or 45 or so. Mm -hmm. The other thing is being overweight. So somebody who is obese, and we have specific criteria for that, uh, a man would have a six-fold increased risk for developing diabetes. That's not a 6% increased risk, that's a six times increased wow. risk. So that's a big risk. But in women, if they're obese, the risk is 27 times higher wow. for developing diabetes. So obesity is a huge risk factor mm -hmm. uh, for developing diabetes. So if you've got either one of those two, then we do recommend getting screened at least annually for diabetes. Now there are other things that are risk uh, factors as well. So women who have developed, delivered a large baby or had gestational diabetes mm -hmm. should get checked regularly because they're at high risk for developing diabetes as well. Mm -hmm. Some other medical conditions like having hypertension or high cholesterol uh, are also risk factors and so should be part of the screening package. Mm -hmm. Interesting, interesting. If, if someone is pre-diabetic and they, they understand uh, they understand that they have that diagnosis. What steps do they need to take to prevent the onset of diabetes? What can you do? So the first thing is what we just talked about, and that's getting screened. When you get screened, we can make the diagnosis of diabetes, or we can tell you oftentimes that you're normal. But then there are a large number of people, about 25% of the population, that fall in this pre-diabetic range, where their blood sugars will be a little bit higher than normal, but not yet diabetic, for example. Mm -hmm. And that's an important uh, group to target because uh, we have the ability to prevent those people from progressing to diabetes. So we know from a very large National Institutes of Health study that was completed several years ago that diet and exercise is the most effective treatment to prevent people from progressing to diabetes. Mm -hmm. This study took about 3,000 people nationally and randomized them to diet and exercise or a medication for diabetes and or just standard uh, advice. And what they found was that the medication decreased risk for developing diabetes by about 30%, mm -hmm. but diet and exercise was twice as effective. Wow. So it's really, really uh, important to get the lifestyle change in gear. Mm -hmm. And when we talk about uh, diet and exercise, we don't mean that people have to uh, lose weight and become a fashion model and <laughs> then become a marathon runner. Right. That's not what we're talking about at all. As little as 10 to 15 pounds of weight loss and exercising for 30 minutes at least five days a week is enough to re decrease the risk for diabetes by uh, about two-thirds. Mm -hmm. And those sorts of um, uh, interventions, those sort of lifestyle changes, I think are achievable for most people who are at risk for developing diabetes. If you think about the hassle factor of having diabetes, 
having to take medications, having to check your blood sugars regularly, the costs that are associated with that, and the increased risk of complications of diabetes, then it doesn't seem so bad to change your diet and start exercising a little bit. Mm -hmm. And there are other good uh, aspects of a healthy diet and weight loss and exercise. They also decrease your risk for car uh, heart disease. Right. And uh, that's important as well because two-thirds of people with diabetes will end up with heart disease. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So these lifestyle interventions, although we all know that we should be doing them, are exceptionally important for people with prediabetes. Yeah. It's not just a suggestion anymore. You know, it's, it's like you really got to do it. It's a prescription, just like yeah. a medication, only more effective. Yeah, yeah, and that's what the study revealed. You know, you talked a little bit and you touched on it there for a second, some of the cautionary tales that you would give those patients that have that prediabetes, or maybe even all of us, right, who, who haven't gotten that diagnosis, but maybe you're living and we don't understand that we do have a prediabetic diagnosis. What are the cautionary tales that you might give you could paint the picture to kind of motivate, and maybe you use them to motivate your patients to make those kinds of changes. Yeah, so um, diabetes has evolved over the last uh, few years, and it really uh, was associated with many long-term complications, including blindness, uh, kidney failure, amputations, and of course, heart disease. Now, as we've learned more about those, we know that uh, if we treat diabetes early and aggressively, we can help to prevent many of those complications. But diabetes is still the leading cause of blindness in adults. It's still a leading cause of people progressing to renal failure, and still a leading cause of non-traumatic amputations in this country. Mm -hmm. So we still have a long ways to go. If we can prevent people from having diabetes, then their risk of those complications goes away. So that's why prevention is so important. So think about family members that have maybe progressed to diabetes and see uh, you know, whether or not you want to go down that track and that pathway or whether or not you'd rather avoid that uh, altogether and live a healthier lifestyle, which will be not only good for preventing diabetes, but good for lots of things. Mm -hmm. uh, there's some research, to, just as we kind of wrap this up, to, to talk about um, pre-diabetes that's going on here at Florida Hospital. Tell me a little bit about the research and, and what we're hoping to learn from that. So there are two things that are going on that I'd like to touch on. The first is, uh, in an extension of this NIH study, the same program is now being offered at YMCAs throughout the Central Florida region. So you can contact your local YMCA and get involved in this diabetes prevention program that has been shown to be so effective if you're at high risk. Mm -hmm. The second thing that's going on is another new National Institutes of Health uh, funded trial. This is a very simple study that aims to test whether vitamin D replacement therapy can help to prevent diabetes. There's some very good short-term studies that suggest that vitamin D may have a very positive benefit. The goal of this study uh, is to see whether or not it really does help to prevent diabetes over about three to four years or so. Mm -hmm. Nationally, we'll enroll uh, over 2,000 patients in this trial, and in uh, the Orlando area, we hope to enroll 150 people in this trial. People will be randomized to either get a vitamin D supplement or a placebo supplement, but everybody will receive good lifestyle advice and should benefit for, for, from participating in the trial. Right. And so uh, 140 people, you said? 150. Is that 150 people. Is that something that is significant for this community? Will it be hard to come up with 150 people for this type of thing? Well, we know that uh, in a city of uh, 1.8 million people, that uh, roughly 600,000 or so will have pre-diabetes or, or diabetes. So no, I don't think the, it's going to be difficult to find yeah. the people. Right. Uh, and our task is really just getting people into the clinic who, first of all, know that they're uh, potentially at risk for de developing diabetes and want to participate and change the course of diabetes. And that's really what it's uh, about, yeah. their own health as well as contributing to the health of the country. And one final thing as we kind of wrap up here to, to talk about, you know, as if someone needs to, to make an appointment to come see a physician, want to talk about diabetes, where should they start off? Should they start off at that family practice doctor, or is, is there a specialist maybe at Florida mm -hmm. Hospital that they should talk to? Tell me specifically what course of action would be best for people. So we always recommend people start with their family da doctor. Those mm -hmm. are, are the uh, docs who are on the front line and really manage uh, all sorts of conditions and can do the screening for diabetes. If people have diabetes, they're welcome to uh, 
contact the Florida Hospital Diabetes Institute, where I and my colleagues practice. Uh, and uh, if necessary, we can adjust uh, treatment regimens and suggest uh, a path uh, for people to follow. We always like to work with the primary care uh, physicians, though, to make sure that everybody is on the, uh, the same page in terms of uh, diabetes management. Mm -hmm. Dr. Prattley, thank you so much. Great information, especially for people with prediabetes and trying to get a handle on this epidemic. We certainly appreciate your time and thank you for, for making time to give us that education today. Um, if you'd like to make an appointment to see Dr. Prattley or one of his colleagues at the Florida Hospital Diabetes Institute, all you have to do is pick up the phone. It's really simple, 407-303. 2822 or you can visit them online www.floridahospitaldiabetesinstitute.com very simple website thanks so much for watching today we certainly are glad you took time out to learn a bit, little bit more about diabetes you can find out more about upcoming web chats that Florida Hospital is going to be hosting just like us on Facebook that's the easiest way to get the information about upcoming chats and also when they're going to be hosted thanks so much for joining us we'll hope you join us again have a great day.